Hey everyone, it's Amanda Rieger Green and Chris Reber. We are coming to you today to talk about the astrology and numerology for July 2021. And we are going to go through the roadmap, the play by play of the month, and also the dialogue between the planets as well as the numerology. So get ready because the month. It's full of dichotomy and it starts out with a bit of a bang. And so just get ready. The transition from June and July into July is not going to be comfortable, right? Yeah, it's definitely going to uh, put you on your toes and kind of throw some curveballs. Uh, yeah, because we're definitely starting out with um, some heavy hitters, a lot of outer planet kind of movement. Um, and then towards the end of the month, there's a lot more inner planet uh, connections. So it kind of eases the tensions that we were feeling at the beginning of the month. Gotcha. And as far as the numerology goes, we are moving uh, from a two month, which was June, into a three month, which is July. And so just a recap on the numerology and how I come up with that. July is the seven, seventh month of the year. 2021 is a five year, two plus zero plus two plus one equals five. So when you add seven plus five, it's the 12 and one plus two equals three. So we've got the 12 energy, the three energy, and then we have the overarching 2021 energy of the five. So to give a quick numerology breakdown, the two is all about balance and harmony and partnerships and how how you interact with the other, what you are learning from the other. And the other is through relationships and not just friendships, partnerships, business relationships, the relationship with yourself, the relationship with your higher self, your higher power, uh, how you relate to your physical body, your emotions. I mean, it's very layered. And the energy of the two is like stop and go, start and stop, because it's like a teeter totter. So it's not blowing and going energy. It gets, it creates an impatience because ultimately the tr two, when it creates balance, wants to create trust and it wants to help you deepen your faith. It's a very intuitive number. So when you move to the three, so you go from this kind of wavy like energy into the three, the three is like, I want to dance. I want to get out. Like I got to break out because the three is the creative child. The yeah. three is all about charisma. It's about connection and socializing. It's about information gathering and sharing, communication, community, lots of C's in the energy of the three. And the three is quite a magical number. I mean, if you look back in history, the three comes up a lot in religion and in spirituality because it is the number of creation. So the basics are if the number one is about the individual, the number two is about the part partnership, the three is what is created from the partnership. So as we transition uh, in like the first week or so of July from June, we move from the two, which is just a little bit slow and internalized and, and also sensitive. I mean, and hello, the sun is in cancer. So we got the two energy that is super, super sensitive because it takes everything personally. And the sun is in cancer, which everything is intimate and personal about cancer. And then you move into this energy that wants to bust out and is fiery and wants to play and is dynamic. It's going to be confusing. So really making sure that your yes means yes and your no means no. Is this a valuable use of my energy, time, talent, whatever it is? Or, you know, do I need to step back? Do I need some rest and rejuvenation and balance? Because believe me, you will get plenty of opportunity this month to utilize the energy of the two. And then to remind you, the overarching energy of 2021 is the five. And the five is all about dynamic shifts and changes. It's about freedom. It's also about luck and opportunity. And Chris knows about the five because it's one of the main numbers in his numerology. And he can speak to this a bit because the five 
changes its mind. And it changes its mind because usually once it's bored with something, once it has ascertained the maximum value out of something, some experience, a relationship, something yeah. it is learning or mastering, it's like, oh, I'm bored. I'm over it. I need something new to do. And so it, and sometimes it forgets it gets aggravated because it gets impatient and it gets so bored and then it's ready for a change. And so the five can throw like little temper tantrums, like a five-year-old. I mean, Chris, I mean, like talk about your five energy just a little bit. So the five energy, um, as I understand it is definitely, it has to learn the difference between, um, like stability and stagnancy, because again, that it's like this fear of boredom. And it's not necessarily like you're like, oh, I'm bored. It's you've tapped all the resources of whatever it is. So if it's a job, you're like, this just isn't fulfilling me the way that it used to. It's like the subconscious shift of you start seeking outside of that job for something else that does bring excitement. There's this thrill seeking of, you know, like I moved during a pandemic, which most people were like, oh my God, why would you move? And I was, cause I wanted something new. I wanted adventure. I didn't move here for a job. I didn't move here for a relationship. I moved just for a change of environment. Um, and it, the thing about the five though, is you have to be careful with complacency. So when you find yourself, um, you know, kind of in you know, beating yourself up or policing yourself and being like, or gossip, that's a really big one too. Like when you find yourself kind of um, complaining or gossiping or um, just really uh, perpetuating these kind of negative narratives because you're bored, uh, you block your blessings. You actually block yourself from yeah. receiving the changes that you are trying to call into your life. So really? It's really interesting energy. It's like a roller coaster. Some days you like have lots of energy. Other days you're just like dead to the world. hundred percent. It's a, it can be a moody energy and the energy of the three, because it's such a charismatic energy, the three can't hide its moods. When it's in a bad mood, everybody feels it. And the five is that way too. So get ready because your mood, you may have mood swings this month. So pay attention to your emotional intelligence, pay attention to your feelings, be in them, feel them, process them as best you can in real time. If you know you're cranky or in a bad mood and people are inviting you to go out and do something and you have the opportunity to say, Hey guys, you know what? I probably shouldn't join this because you might behave badly, you know, high, being able to really be more proactive versus reactive will be helpful this month. But yeah. what I will say about the combo of the three and the five, it, there's right place, right time energy, like nobody's business. You can make connections this month that will boom, open new doors set you off in the right direction. And when you have those windows of opportunity, they usually come from a place of harnessing the higher vibrations of both the three and the five. So when the five recognizes that it's not stable and it's up and down and it's trying to find stability through its gossip or its, its poor behaviors or the three is saying yes to everything and feeling scattered and then being superficial and inauthentic and, and really not true to itself and not true to the voice inside and, and an authentic voice coming out from the outside, then those are the low vibrations. But when there's an authentic communication, that's the energy of the three, the inside voice matching the outside voice and being genuine in who you are and how you represent yourself in this moment in time. And then you're also flexible with the energy of the five and being able to give yourself permission to change your mind, but be accountable in that all of a sudden, because you make that good decision or, and not that anything is good or bad, but you make that decision that is aligned with those energies. Next thing you know, someone's going to call you out of the blue and say, Hey, I was thinking about you. Can you do X, Y, and Z? And you're going to say, <gasps> I've been wanting to do that. Oh my goodness. I mean, so that's, that's the opportunity and the luck in this month. When yeah. The, when and flexibility the and malleability are really big themes with the thought five, yeah. because personally, I found the more that I try to have a plan, the plan gets tossed out the window, you know? So you have to be able to pivot and um, to meet yourself where you are in the moment rather than where you think you're going to go or where you want to go. Like, 
you know, so you made plans with someone a couple of days in advance and the day comes and you're like, you know what, today I'm actually not really feeling very social or I'm not very fun to be around right now. So it's okay to make another choice and to change your plans, right? This is a, I mean, and what you just articulated is beautiful because this is a wonderful month to really, really be present to yourself, your needs, the valuable use of your energy and time and interactions. Are you going to show up valuably to the people you love, the people around you and the interactions? And of course we know you got work, you got commitments. There are things that you you have to show up for. We're not talking about that, but really being mindful of yourself and what you're capable of and being able to, to show up in a way that is in integrity. And that's mm -hmm. where those are where those sweet spots are, where you will grow, you will shift, you will change and evolve. And then boom, it's like Jupiter kind of energy, which is luck and opportunity. And then it deepens your faith and trust. And there'll be synchronicities and sign that will, signs that will guide you along the way. Well, okay. and the three reminds me, I think I asked you this a while ago, but the numbers yeah. kind of correlate to planets a little bit. Like when you were talking about the two, I kept feeling about like moon or lunar energy. It felt very um, cancerous. Yes. Um, and then the three feels very Jupiterian or even, um, and the five to me is very Uranus. It's very like dynamic yeah. and up and down. So, um, and the four, the four is Saturn. Saturn. Up Saturn. Yeah, four is serious Saturn. Six, <laughs> Cancer. <laughs> mm -hmm. seven, seven is Sagittarius and a little bit Capricorn. It's kind of like a combo between Sag and Capricorn. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yes, absolutely. They all correlate. I mean, there's so much dialogue between astrology and numerology and, 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 and all of those things. Okay, let's dive into the beginning of July's astrology. We start out with an opposition, and I want to start by Chris talking to everyone a little bit about ingressions versus transits, because we start out the month where Mars is opposite Saturn, and that is a transit. When the moon, when Mercury moves into Cancer a few days later, that's an ingression. So what are transits, Chris? So transits are basically the conversations between planets as the planets are moving in real time in the sky, right? The ingress is when a planet changes a sign. So you just said, you know, Mercury going from Gemini into Cancer, that's the ingress. And the ingresses is kind of how we follow the conversation because certain signs, they make certain angles. And in astrology, we're always, it's very mathematical. We're very concerned with, um, you know, in an opposition, the planets are 180 degrees apart. Signs of opposition, Cancer and Capricorn. So that's where we would find oppositions. Uh, squares are 90 degrees apart, right? So we'd look at like Libra and Capricorn, that's a square, okay? So when a planet ingresses into certain signs, we're already predicting, okay, there's gonna be some square energy, there's gonna be some oppositional or trine energy when there's 120 degrees between planets, right? So it's really just about how the planets are communicating with each other and what uh, tone it sets for uh, the forecast. Gotcha, perfect. Okay, so we start out with Mars opposite Saturn and Saturn is retrograde and Mars is in Leo, Saturn is in Aquarius and it's retrograde in Aquarius. So let's talk about the opposition and let's talk about Mars opposite Saturn and that is July 1st. Yes, so this immediately when I pulled up the, the month and the, the transits, this is a test of patience because Saturn is all about delayed gratification. It is hard work and responsibility. Mars is your ego, but it's also how you exert and um, apply yourself. It's your physical body and uh, conflict too. So oppositions work oppositionally. They usually work through the lens of other people that we're related to uh, or just in our life, right? So one person is acting more like Mars energy and the other person is acting more like Saturn, which is authority, okay? Um, so this is where 
conflicts arises, maybe you're having an issue with a boss, a coworker, uh, a parent, a family member. This could, it's, it's going to uh, manifest very viscerally in your outer reality. Like you're, you know, you're going to like uh, be at the grocery store and then somebody's going to like curse at you or something. That's this kind of energy. And it's, testing our patience it's testing our reactions to things because mars is how we react and it's the immediate i'm gonna go do this thing or my you know i'm gonna like lash out in aggression and saturn is pulling mars back it's trying to curb your impulses that's really what this transit is testing you and trying to get you to see is when am i being triggered in a martian way or a saturnian way and or how am I triggering other people that's also how because you yes. can be the triggerer and so being able to place awareness towards okay what's going on how am I showing up in this interaction because it's going to be between two people and what is my blind spot what am I not seeing yes. because your immediate response is going to be I want to bite their head off because Mars is involved but the lesson is, let's not do that. Let's figure out another way. <laughs> right. And so with this, remember that as we move in the last couple of days of June, and this happens, you know, July 1st, you'll probably feel this the last day of June, July 1st, July 2nd. So it's probably about a three-day energy so practice your patience, you know, does this need to be said right now? Does this need to be said by me? Does this need to be said at all? Or what is this triggering within me? Or what am I triggering within someone else? And how does that feel? Does it feel good? Or yeah. does it feel like resistance? And we've talked about time and energy changing. So the more aware we are and with the numerology and listening to that dialogue and the communication, where can you pull back and use your voice in a way that comes from a place of love, kindness, compassion? And even when you're not feeling that, being able to step back and not project it externally onto someone else. So just patience is the name of the game. It is. And I will say, I always say when it comes to Mars, the medicine for Mars is physical exertion. It's through the body. So if yeah. you can get out and exercise, do some kind of cardio, uh, kickboxing, or even just like screaming into a pillow. Like if you're really activated, uh, it's about channeling your anger and there's righteous anger and unrighteous anger, but it's about channeling your anger in a healthy way because no emotion is unhealthy. Really. We're, uh, we're in these bodies. We're allowed to feel whatever it is we're supposed to feel, but what we're not entitled to is, um, subjecting other people to those emotions and reactions. Um, especially if they're, you know, combative or very chaotic or uh, vitriolic too. Yeah. The other thing with uh, the Saturn opposition to Mars is um, be really careful with decisions, right? This is, this is the kind of energy where you may want to try to push a certain agenda forward and you're going to get pushed back. So notice when you're being a little too pushy, a little too aggressive, or again, you could also be the one that's uh, withholding something too. Yeah. And again, this correlates completely with the astrology and moving from the two to the three, where we're going from, we've already learned some relationships some patience, some trust, some self-awareness, you know, and we're going to jump into that three energy where we want to just get everything out. And so it's, it's the balance and the dialogue between those two. And like Chris said, Mars is in Leo, which is another fire sign. Mars is already fiery in and of itself. You know, it rules Aries. So work it out, people. Like get out, work it out, go on a walk, get in nature, sweat it out. So that way you are detoxing all of that energy because guess what? When you detox and move that energy, you invite greater light and filament coating to come in to shift and elevate your consciousness. And that's what this is all about. This is about evolution and we're in extremely evolutionary times on the planet. So these tools and tips or this navigational way to really become aware. And is there any perfect way or roadmap to this? Heck no. And are you going to do this right and well? Probably not. But it's being able to look back and say, ah, oh, that's where the energy triggered me. Oh, shoot, I tripped up. 
and you get to learn and you get to grow. And that's what's fun about it, right? Yeah. And a good rule of thumb whenever Mars is active, um, activated is give conflict or arguments like 72 hours to percolate because when you're in a heightened emotional state, you can't really think clearly and your decision-making is going to be influenced. So again, like how you said, like, do I need to say this now? Does it need to be said by me? Um, Give yourself time and space from and separation from a situation before addressing it. Yeah. hundred percent. So the next thing we roll into, which is, is going to be the sun is squaring Chiron. Yeah. <laughs> so, so basically the first and the fourth, and then, and on the fourth, the sun squares Chiron and Mars squares Uranus. So the first through the fourth and essentially like right up until the fifth, it's intense guys. Okay. Sun in cancer squares Chiron in Aries. Chiron. So first off, Chiron, for those that are unfamiliar, is the wounded healer. And Chiron is when it's activated or it's in the field, whether it's in your personal chart, it's being triggered or it's just collectively. This is old stuff. This is this is wounding and issues that you have carried your entire lifetime. This is and it's stuff that never really goes away. You just get better at dealing with it. So. The sun is your position. The sun is your identity. It's how you want to be seen. It's how you shine. When sun is square to Chiron, there's maybe issues around that. So maybe uh, a, a person feels that you're, um, you know, you're taking away an opportunity from them or you're taking away attention that they are really seeking after. Um, but it really, it can also be like conflicts with authority because the sun is represents authority figures too, similar to Saturn, but it's more like father figures. So a lot of father issues arise when sun is involved. Uh, woundings around father or, or the paternal parent figure are really common here. But what it, but the conflict of the square, it provides a position or it puts you in a position for really great healing because Chiron ultimately is about healing you or recognizing the ways in which you're wounded and the ways you react to your wounds, your old issues and saying, okay, I don't want to act that way anymore. I need to make a different choice. So really notice your reactions around the fourth and hello, it's the 4th of July. So, you know, people are probably going to be celebrating and partying, but just kind of notice like what is being activated around that time. Um, because it's a lot and it, it can, it can feel raw. It can feel really heavy. And, you know, what's interesting is when you talk about the sun and vitality and the representation of the masculine or the father figure, the sun is in cancer, the mother figure. So there's Mm -hmm. a lot of polarity and opportunity for healing and healing yin and yang, masculine and feminine energy. And guess what? When it's working with Chiron, which is, you know, Chiron's in Aries, which is about the individual, you know, it's about individuality, individuation. What's beautiful about that is there's an opportunity for recalibrating through these, through whatever is triggered uh, in the square, recalibrating masculine and feminine energies to move more into the divine, the divine feminine, the divine masculine. Does it mean you're going to experience those aha moments, those days, but no, that's what is being, that's what's being squared within you to pull that crap out and yeah. make space for higher consciousness, higher, more elevated feeling, thinking, being, and resynchronizing those energies. And again, moving from the two to the three, it's creating opportunity for you to shift up in vibrational consciousness, awareness, and being. And so square energy, it doesn't necessarily manifest so much in the outer field. It's more an internal thing that you feel. It's this pressure that kind of builds and you notice it, you feel it. And, And people who are born with squares in the birth chart know what I'm talking about because it's this nagging feeling that is always there and never goes away. So around the forest, sun square to Chiron, it's this nagging feeling that has built up pressure and it's calling for release. But again, 
how are, how are we managing those reactions? And then let's talk about Mars square Uranus because it's happening on the same darn day. So I, whenever I see this, uh, be careful when you car because Mars governs the car. Um, and this is a combination for accidents. Like Uranus actually governs earthquakes and accidents and unexpected events. So when there are clashing in this way, it's very common that people get into accidents. And then it's the 4th of July. So hello, no drinking and driving, be mindful, you know, where you are, make sure that you're safe. And we're not saying this is like scare tactics, but, you know, and then Uranus and Taurus, I mean, look at all of the Taurus is an earth sign. We've had so much since Uranus has been in Taurus um, disruption uh, from the planet, you know, I mean, just earthquakes, fires, all, uh, hurricanes, all, all the things. So just know that the 4th of July is a really, it's, there's an intense energy here. So make sure that you are well hydrated, that you've got your own inner stability and peace and ability to be mindful of yourself, your needs, and who, what situations and scenarios you're inserting yourself into or parties or groups you're associating with you know, just be mindful of that. And, you know, like, just be cautious, be cautious. Yeah. Um, and again, Mars is involved. So ego battles, this is, this is very confrontational type of energy and it's unexpected too. So you may think like, you may have an interaction with someone where you think like things are good and then they bring up an issue and it's just, it's out of the blue and it takes, it rips the rug from out from under you. And you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that you know, this was a thing. And so, um, again, manage your reactions, uh, put some space and time between whatever the argument is, but yeah, I, I see this energy as being, it's very chaotic. It's very, uh, five up and down, you know, yeah. very much. Okay. Fortune. Let's, let's get on to something good. Once we move <laughs> to the fifth, the sun in Cancer is going to sextile Uranus in Taurus. Talk about a sextile. So a sextile is a 60 degree angle between planets and it's harmonizing and it's creative and it's, it's just, it's a feel good kind of energy. So again, if the sun represents you um, and Uranus, it represents, it's the great change maker. It is higher wisdom, higher insight. When these two come together, it allows you to take a step back and to take in the broader perspective. It allows you to see where your blind spots are and to innovate the ways that you are showing up in the world or uh, making decisions and, and so forth. So it's going to provide you um, a boost of support for whatever you've been dealing with the first couple of weeks of the month. Yeah. Absolutely. And also because the sun is in cancer and Uranus is in Taurus, I'm like, go get out in the water because <laughs> Taurus being earth, cancer being water. It's like, go to the beach, go to the lake, get, or, you know, get outside some way, shape or form, take a shower, an Epsom salt, you know, um, shower, not a bath. I'm not real big on that because I feel like you end up just kind of absorbing the muck <laughs> of the energy. I mean, it's, if you've got sore muscles, I get it, but, but, you know, like do an Epsom salt scrubbed because of what has transpired between the fourth, the first, excuse me, and the fifth, it's a really good the time to cleanse and clear energy to have insights into whoa okay look at what i have learned and transitioned through in just five days of the month dang so yeah. this would be to me a really great day if you live near the ocean or the beach or a body of water to get outside and just spend a little bit of time with earth nature water or if you can't do that you know, take a shower with some Epsom salt, do an Epsom salt scrub, really good for cleansing and clearing energy and conducting the communication between sun and Uranus. Yeah. And I also would say it's, it's get outside of your box, like do something new or try something new that you haven't done before. Cause Uranus energy best channeled is it's unconventional. It's all about approaching things with a curious mind or a different approach. So, um, 
yeah and, and when the sun is involved it's a lot about it could be appearances could be like changing up your hairstyle changing the way that you dress changing the way that you just present in general so um that could be like another thing that you do too for sure and that's of course all this correlates with the energies of the three and the five change adaptability flexibility communication charisma all all of it coordinates okay yeah. so on the six we have another another intense a little bit more intense aspect mercury in gemini squares neptune and pisces and um neptune is retrograde at this point so mercury the mind intelligence communication it totally correlates with the energy of the three it's all about information gathering and sharing and processing and communication that day to day. That's, that's the energy of the three. So they're very similar and it's going to square Neptune, which is retrograde in Pisces. And I'm going to let you talk about that. That's so an, an interesting. This, one. this configuration essentially is like a Mercury retrograde on crack because, and which we actually experienced the same transit during yeah. this past Mercury retrograde. So yeah. Yeah, it's Mercury gonna... is direct now, hallelujah, yeah. but it's almost like a look back where mm -hmm. stuff can come back up to bite yes. you in a... a revisiting of whatever happened in this past Mercury retrograde, you're going to get another chance to look at it. The thing is, when Neptune is involved, Neptune obscures whatever it touches because it is all about illusion and delusion and dreams and fantasy. Um it's kind of like putting rose colored glasses on a situation. So you may not be able to see things as clearly as they present. So this also means you are not coming across as clearly as you present. When you're communicating, you have to be very careful with the language that you're using uh, and your intentions because it's going to be misread. It's going to be mis interpreted that's just how neptune works because it's trying to get you to refine the ways in which you communicate yes uh yeah that's i think that's pretty much everything i want to say about that yeah so just be mindful see what comes up and if anything comes up that had happened you know in the three or four weeks prior during Mercury retrograde, you know, see what you want to revise and also take a moment to reflect and be a bit introspective. It's a great day to do a little bit of meditation and mm. kind of go within. It's a great morning. Start that morning out with just a short meditation. You don't have to meditate for 10 minutes, but it would be a good day to start out in a meditative state or to journal just so you get your day started out in that more introspective and that mode of the communication of Mercury, the mind and Neptune, this higher state of consciousness. And so, hello, upgrading yep. opportunity for upgrading consciousness, but through a little bit of tension or conflict that may arise from something from the past. This is also, um, people are you're likely to feel very like foggy minded just because again neptune governs fog and uh it veils and dissolves what it touches in a way too so you may just not feel like you're able to think clearly around this time um if somebody's asking you for a, a decision or clarity like this is not the time to make any kind of decisions this is the time to go inside and be very introspective um what else oh this is don't gossip around this time because it will come back to bite you gemini is super gossip energy and then when neptune's involved it's like it, it will bite you in the ass like this is don't mess around with it <laughs> good call good <laughs> call and guess what the three the three loves to gossip so yeah, yeah mm -mm, one of those. And then the five, you get the five in that. Chris already said there can be kind of gossipy, you know, behavior. So that is, those are those two, you know, vibes of those energies where it's like, uh, 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 we want to harness the energies because you want luck and opportunity. So caution flags this day, you know, just take it, be more reflective, meditate, but it's not a big action day. And if you feel foggy, if you feel tired, don't shame yourself for that. Allow yourself to not feel clear. We're just so type A, go, do, box check. This is not a day for that. And yes, yeah, suit up and show up for what you need to be accountable for, but make sure that you take your, your internal time. So on the 7th, Venus opposes Saturn. Venus will be in Leo at this point, And Saturn, of course, in Aquarius, retrograde. Another opposition, 
Yeah. So another opposition, again, it's going to show up through other people. And this, I actually really, I actually like this opposition because of compared. Why? To, I'm like, why? Well, because compared to Mars, yeah, Mars is impulsive. Venus is accommodating. So this time, Saturn's testing your values around this time because Venus represents our values. And it's also a really good time to budget. Okay. So if there's any kind of money stuff coming up, it's a really good time to get your finances in order. Saturn will help lay a foundation or provide structure for whatever it is that you need to do. You know, when I see this, I'm like, okay, do your taxes or, you know, get your bills all in order because this is that kind of energy, but it's, but Saturn, whatever it touches, it tests and it challenges to see if it's sustainable, right? So if the ways that you have been conducting yourself, the ways that you've been showing up are not in alignment with your values, then you are going to really notice it. And Saturn is going to clear a path. It's going to sometimes remove people, places, and things from you because it's like, okay, this is not sustainable. It has to go. So it's a really good uh, reality check on, okay, what is it that I value? And I think you know, personally this past year, uh, the, the pandemic and talking to a lot of clients, we have gotten a lot of context of like, what do we value? Not just, you know, financially and monetarily, but on like a, a soul level, like a spiritual level. Um, I think I know a lot of people who've come back to their home of origin because they wanted to be closer to their family. Like these are things that you should really be considering if you're not already. Yeah. I mean, and I love that because that comes up a lot with me and clients. And one of the things that I often share that I learned a while back is when I um, dislike or really abhor big words, you know, someone's attitudes, actions, or behaviors, that's when I recognize that a value has shifted within me. It's mm -hmm. not about the other person. It's that it's, and it's not that I dislike them or abhor them. And those are big words. And sometimes it's even, or hate. And it's not that I'm a hater or hateful, but sometimes we really dislike an interaction. And it's not so much about the person. It's that it's classic clashing up us against a value that's actually shifted. And yeah. so this is a great time, I think, bringing that up to recognize and especially coming out of this retrograde phase, which has rewired with Mercury in, in, in retrograde in Gemini, the sign of the mind, its home sign. It has recognized, like recognize, it has rewired some of our brain and our thinking, which is also coming into our core values. And we're in cancer. Cancer right. is not just about hearth and home and personal interactions. It's the soul. It's like it's the soul it's ruled by the moon it's the hero's journey so yeah. this is a, i love how you're framing this as an opportunity to recognize maybe where and what you value and what may be still a little bit what kinks need to be worked out what relationships or interactions or experiences have you yeah. outgrown have i outgrown you know and then and then how can we start to tweak that and Venus is very relational. So this is probably going to show up in your personal relationships yeah. very apparently. Um, and I like what you said about, you know, when the value has shifted within you, um, it's not about the other person. And this opposition is really going to frame it in that way. So you, you're really going to notice it. Um, the other thing is Venus loves to be accommodating to a fault where it will people please and it will go and do. So notice if you're kind of uh, leaning into people pleasing behavior, if you are sucking it up, if, if there's someone that rubs you the wrong way and you're biting your tongue, I'm not saying for you to like lash out or to speak out against it, but recognize, okay, this person is not in alignment with me investigate why and then uh see how you can approach the situation of like okay like i just need to create a different boundary with this person right i can handle this person in certain contexts certain environments and that's where the boundary is it's not uh, that i can't ever be around them it's just i can only be around them in these certain ways absolutely and i mean i can already see a lot of this energy happening for me personally 
and then yeah. a lot of things in retrograde and and so I'm recognizing that I've had some shifts and some 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 of my behaviors and values and interactions and hello like you're talking to two Libras here, even though we're very Scorpionic and Plutonian. Um, yeah. You're talking to two Libras who, uh, what rules Libra? V- Venus. So people pleasing can be a thing. I mean, the, the two of us get that. We know when we're in our people pleasing, but as we evolve, we learn that we cannot be everything to everyone. And when we people please, we are inauthentic, disingenuous, and not in our truth. And that, and not in alignment and able to connect consciously with our higher self and our higher power. So we are disconnected from the source of the spirit in those, in in those instances. So that's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. The eighth, the eighth, we've got here Venus again. So Venus is going to square Uranus. Yes. So Venus square to Uranus. Um, Okay, I again, I like this the squares between Uranus and the, the planets like Venus and Mars because on a very personal level, these can be really good relationally if you know how to navigate them properly. Right. Venus square to your or Venus square to Ven- I can't speak. Venus square to Uranus is a really good time for um, innovating and uh approaching your relationships in a different way. Um, you also might find yourself attracted to different kinds of people that you, you didn't have any idea of before. Like, you know, if you're out in the world, you see you're attracted to different kinds of um, expanding the box of what you're used to, expanding your comfort zone. That's really what this energy is best used for. Now, again, uh, Venus represents money too. So there can be some kind of... Um, issues surrounding finances. I don't know why. I mean, I'm in a financial space right now, so I feel like that's why it keeps coming up. But I know for a lot of clients I've worked with recently, um, a lot of uh, reframing their relationships to money is a really big one. Yeah. And, Uh, and with Venus back to money values and, and also, you know, talking about abundance period, but, you know, a big thing for me for a long time was abundance. And, and it really, it came from the mindset of my lower based ego that abundance was financial. And then I had an epiphany years ago and it was like, oh, no, it's an abundance of time. It's abundance of happiness. It's an abundance of joy. It was, it's all, well, it, it morphed. And then once I recognized and started to learn how to embody abundance, then, you know, it came, it became a different story for me because there's another deeper level to Venus, which comes through both Taurus, which it rules and Libra, which are the still waters that run deep, which is peace. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's yeah. where, that's where I am on my Venus journey these days. Cause I've been able to work through a lot of the financial kinks and my issues around that. And now it's like I seek peace, peaceful relationships and people. And it's not that I, I don't want to have the discourse and the dialogue and the interesting perspectives and the curiosity. No, I love all of that. I love the dichotomy. I love the tension and the understanding and the psychology and learning. But ultimately, I'm seeking a sense of peace deep down uh, and peace, whether it be around, you know, money or people relationships, but ultimately peace within. So I am offering that out into the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, And again, with Venus involvement, if you are coupled during this time, um, you're probably going to get into an argument. It's just the nature (laughs) of what it is. Um, But it's also like, Uranus energy, it's just, it's very interesting. And the only thing you can expect is the unexpected. So this is where I say you have to keep an open mind. You have to keep a a curiosity, like a Gemini curiosity, whenever you're approaching, approaching Uranus energy, because you might surprise yourself um, or somebody might surprise you, you know? Um, So again, you just talked in the language of the five and the three. Three being curiosity, five being flexible and changing your mind. And so again, there's the astro numero code repeating itself, you know. Yeah, it's very ever present. 
<laughs> okay. So the next, now we are moving into on the ninth, there is a new moon in 18 degrees of cancer and it occurs at 8, 16 PM central standard time. And on the 10th, so these things are coupled together. There's, there's something happening that, that impacts the new moon itself. So cancer new moon, but also on the 10th, the new moon opposes Pluto, which is retrograde in Capricorn. So there's a few layers to this new moon. First of all, new moon in cancer, cancer, hearth, home, family, nurture. It's like having a dinner party, cooking for your family, spending intimate time. It's like a bowl of soup. I know it's the summer, but like, you know, (laughs) It's like, I love soup in the summer. <laughs> I soup in the summer. You know, it's like a bowl of soup. It is. It's like nurturing. It's again, it's having those, those people that are your tribe or your family close to you and really feeling intimate and personal. But ultimately to me, you know, there's so much depth to cancer because it really is about the soul. It's about the psyche and the hero's journey and where you are at this point in your journey of what brings you happiness. Because ultimately, the moon to me, apart from it ruling the psyche and, and what's going down there is, you know, what's bringing me happiness. Yeah. So that's, that's a big thing that, that comes up for me around cancer and cancer new moon. Okay, talk to us about this, and especially with the moon itself opposing Pluto. Yeah. Um, so of course, whenever we're talking about these transits, if you're familiar with your chart, see the house context of where these moons are taking place because it's going to give you more understanding of how it's showing up for you. So yes, in general, cancer is about the home and about the hearth and connecting and nurturing. But again, I think, you know, before we got on this call, we were talking about this Capricorn full moon and the polarity access of Capricorn and cancer. It's father, it's mother, it's this home and it's who I am in the world. And it's about mothering yourself it's about taking care of yourself so this new moon it's a uh new opportunity because new moons are openings or beginnings of how can i be a better parent to myself and when pluto is involved in the opposition Pluto energy is very compulsive and obsessive. So this is likely to draw out some really deep seated feelings that you have been either repressing because that's what we do with Pluto. We repress and push it down. And so now it's up for discussion. It's up for review. And this is not the time to push it down any further because whatever is coming up is a chance for you to ultimately heal it so that you don't go back into those same compulsions and obsessions and fixations. And what's beautiful about this is even though it's a new moon, it has a very full moon energy to it because of the opposition and being in Capricorn, which is cancer's opposition, the opposite, the polarity of cancer. So there's new moon, full moon energy, which to me is a little bit of eclipse. And I love that because this is a moon that may bring up some suppressed or repressed memories, trauma, pain, childhood wounding Mm -hmm. for you to be able to safely recognize. And it's not about healing it in the moment or figuring it out or fixing it. It's really more about awareness. What is coming up within me? You know, what emotions am I feeling or experiencing? And what memories are coming back that maybe I can correlate or I've repressed or suppressed? And and all of these, um, you know, whether they're transits or ingressions and the lunar cycles, everything is so divinely timed. They, it happens when we're ready. So whatever is coming up, ha, no matter how you experience it, whether it's painful or beautiful, it's, you know, it's basically two sides of the same coin and it's an opportunity to go a level deeper, peel another layer back from that onion. Yeah. And, you know, the, the moon cycle, if you do follow the new moon and the full moons, the moon is all about the emotions. So it's always going to have an emotional component to it. And, you know, I think a lot of times when I work with people, um, there's not always a great language we have for uh, dealing with our emotions. There's not a, we don't have the tools and the resources to navigate our emotions 
because a lot of us just like push it down or ignore it until it makes itself really well known. This is the kind of moon that you don't have a choice. It's going to be in your face because Pluto's involved. So whatever is surfacing, do not ignore it because it is asking for your attention for a reason. Yeah. And, and our emotions are quite intelligent. And of course, you know, Chris, it's dear to my heart, emotional intelligence, emotional communication and processing is really, is really what leads to discernment, that interconnection of the head and the heart. And that's what opens up, you know, different levels of the, the human body and accessing higher levels of DNA, consciousness, and then in the emotional intelligence sometimes is connected actually to our cognizance, which then accesses us to higher realms of thinking. So it's a very powerful and profound moon, yet it's yeah. also, it's a very private and internal moon too. It's a very personal moon. So this is not like go out and party. <laughs> necessarily. It's not, you're going to want to maybe binge Netflix. I mean, that sounds like a coping mechanism I would do. And also cancer. I mean, I'm an emotional eater. Like, I mean, this is no secret. So I'm like, Oh shoot. Like, I, like, you know, well, like Netflix and, and food, Lord have mercy. I better not have any ice cream in the house or else it'll all be gone. Well, it's good that you bring up coping mechanisms because yeah. um, this is definitely going to bring up so the ways in which we nurture ourselves yeah. or we are not, or we're abandoning ourselves. And so um, what are your coping mechanisms? What are your uh, automatic responses that, you know, when you are in an emotional state, what do you reach for? Is yeah. it alcohol and substances? Is it escapism? Is it through food? Is it through social connection? Because sometimes people use socializing as a way to disconnect yeah themselves because they don't want to be alone. They don't want to deal with themselves. They want to be with other people. This is the kind of moon where it's, it's kind of going to force you to go inside. And the more that you avoid it, well, you never really avoid it because it's going to come back eventually, but right. this moon is not really going to give you much of a choice. 